you need at least three months information to make any sound decisions. SWOT stands for strengths. You, you examine your strengths and then you examine your weaknesses. Where are you weak? One of the mistakes people make in, in organizations is they look at the weaknesses they have internally, but they don't look at the weaknesses that are coming upon them from the expert. So then, but that's, there's more to that in a second. Then there are opportunities. This is where you're supposed to, supposed to focus. You look for your opportunities first, and then you examine the threats from the outside world. And you examine those things in a way that you do not become confused. I suggest you don't have that help you to get to your goals. Maybe you set some little objectives that people can meet first in your organization so that they feel better about themselves, so they feel that they're accomplishing something. The objective gets easily tackled. The goal takes a little longer. I'm going to give you a goal at the end of this. And you're going to say, really? Are you nuts? <laughs> at least I hope so. <laughs> operational planning. You then draw an operational plan. I already have an operational plan in my head. We're not going to go through that. It's take too long. But I will give you the main goal that we can all share if we want to. At that point, you can measure results. I would suggest you measure your results year by year and you do your operational plan year by year. As we come to the end of this year, we have a breakfast. We get together and we talk about some of these things. We'll talk about the structure a little later. We'll talk about another arm called financing, how you have to think about money. And then we'll come to a conclusion, each one of us. And we'll decide whether we want to work together or not. Amen? Amen. 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 So you begin with strategic thinking. You emphasize goals and outcomes. You begin to think strategically because you're always concerned about goals. Your goals are your mission. The things you're looking to accomplish are, are built on a set of goals. Step two, define your mission in the light of God's plan. Christian organizations exist to produce a result of value to God and to contribute to his plan. If what you're doing has no value to God, forget about it. We're not interested. You know, if it's all about you, fine. If we're faithful, we can be assured that our Lord will provide opportunities for ministry and service. It is by taking advantage of God's given opportunities that we fulfill the purpose for which he created us, which is called our calling. Every one of us is called. We're called to do different things. You know what you're good at. You know what you're capable of. Focus on that. Don't focus on being somebody else. That's a lot of nonsense. You weren't born to be somebody like Benny Hinn. I'm going to talk about Benny Hinn in a second. <laughs> Step three, develop that vision. A vision for the future fleshes out the mission concept. It's stated in terms of long-term accomplishments and milestones. Vision describes a preferred but not a fixed future. You can change your vision statement, but your mission pretty much re remains the same. People don't think they can change their vision statement and they die with it because the vision statement becomes old after a period of time. The world changes around you and you're trying to do the same thing for your benefit, forget it. What happens is, things begin to fall apart. The vision can be changed. The vision must come from God first. God is in charge. How does it come from God first? If you're not a prayer, become a prayer. Some false perceptions of vision. Vision is not an attempt to predict the future. It's not some grand plan measured out on a large scale. 
It's not limited by today. Vision describes a preferred future, not an absolute future. It is not one person's dreams. That's a huge mistake that's made. Vision is not a fixed plan. The strategic planning process analyzes the status and gauges the effect of both the internal and external environment on our vision and mission. If that sounds cons complicated, take a look at SWOT again. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What opportunities do you see? And what threats are there out there? And some of those threats may be friends of yours. They may be family. What you're accomplishing for God, you're accomplishing for God. That's your ultimate purpose, right? So, as I said before, when you do that analysis, you do it with three people, but not more than five. Major issues at the core of the strategic planning process and brief, this step entails a comparison of the vision for the future with the current status and those environmental circumstances we were talking about. You prioritize those major issues and you take them out one at a time if you can. Don't let people draw you in 25 different directions at the same time. They'll try because whatever they've got in sight, whatever they want done, well, that's the most important thing in the world, isn't it? They'll let you know about it. There are many systems for operational planning. Management by objectives is one of the simplest and most straightforward methods. Your results will be measured by how much you accomplish relative to your strategic goals. When you set a goal, believe you can accomplish it. No matter how crazy it sounds, believe you can accomplish it. I'm getting ready to finish here, but it's an important, important point. Let's say I pick a goal. And I say, all together, this small room of, of people, there's not quite enough of us yet, but we're at least a third of the number we need to accomplish the goal I'm about to mention. Let's say we want to grow all of us together as a group, and we want to be able to affect positively those around us, regardless of what their major thrust is, their major calling is. We want to help one another. Well, one of the ways you become more powerful and capable is advertising, right? But you can't afford to advertise, so forget about that. Let's say you just want to be seen. You want to be seen standing alone in front of a podium like that? and making your mouth go up and down and saying some words and people listen or they don't? Or would you like to be seen as a, as a potential power? All right, here's your first goal. There's maybe 20, no more than 30 people in this room. I firmly believe the 30 of us can start something that by next December, we can fill the target center. Sound unrealistic? Sound stupid, does it? How can 30 people begin to fill the target center? Well, I don't believe in fairy tales either. So I picked the goal that we already accomplished. We filled the target center two days in a row and we had Benny Hinn in here. Well, people want to attribute that to Benny Hinn. He's not the reason the target center was filled. Most of the people in this state didn't want Benny Hinn here. You couldn't get the Christian Chronicle to run a, a five line ad. They wouldn't do it. They didn't believe in him. Most of the Christian organizations in this state didn't want to see him at all. He hadn't been here in close to 20 years. And the reason was because he couldn't put together enough people to start a bonfire, let alone a fire that would spread across the state. 
He couldn't get the job done. And he had a great organization. He had people that knew how to, how to draw folks to him and everything else. But I'm going to show you the problem with his organization. It was all about him. This is the gift that Benny gave us for filling the target set. One half of his bookends that say Benny Hinn Ministry. Very impressive. Totally useless. No functionality. You need both ends of the bookends to hold the books. Right? Yeah, yeah. Show and tell doesn't amount to anything. Great speeches don't amount to anything. Action amounts to something. If you're going to pull together to do something, it should be something you can accomplish. But most of the time, people don't have a big enough opinion of God to realize they can accomplish much more than they ever accomplished. And the major reason is they accomplished it alone. How did we fill the target set? It wasn't Benny Hinn. You got the few, the core together. The people that believed in Benny Hinn got together and they began to get others that believed together to bring their people together. When we got 96 churches, it took nine months. When we got 96 churches, we had enough to fill the target set. You got it? And why did they agree to have all their people come to the meeting? Because they got to sit on a podium and be seen. Want to know what human nature is? Human nature is I'm the king, you just don't know it yet. So there's 96 of us sitting up there, who's the king? Benny's the king. for a day, for two days. And then all 96 of those churches went their own separate way having had their pictures taken, having been able to be viewed by 16,000 people at a time and then seen in the news. And then they all went home and did nothing. Well, I'm not gonna tell you what I think we should be doing. Because you're going to have to come to that conclusion yourself. But it's more than filling the target set. That's a simple goal. We'll fill it. You want to fill it? We'll fill it. You want to get 16,000 people in one place? We'll get them in one place. Looks monumental? It's not. This is a monument to stupidity. This is my gift. One half of a set of bookends. No functional use whatsoever. I suggest we get together. I suggest we begin to set a goal like that. Only we set it with some other things in mind. Not just filling the target center, but employing the people that we use to fill the target, target center to do other things. To gather people together to get them saved, fulfill the Great Commission. But also to get them involved with us so that we can grow even more. Because the body of Christ right now is spread from here to there. I've talked too long. If you don't get it by now, you're never going to get it. And you don't want to get it. That's not reverse psychology. That's just a simple, declarative statement of fact. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. 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 Can I do that? Yeah, let's do that. I want to introduce someone to you who can talk about finances, because in this world, there are certain things that you need to cover. Everything has a cost. So, 
The people in this room are not going to cover the cost of filling the gardens. Right? We have to begin to understand what financing is all about. And much of it is about credit. The man I'm going to introduce to you is Aaron Johnson. He's a credit manager for Fury Motors in Stillwater. And he has a few things to say. Sure. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having me here today. It's nice to be with you all. Um, I'm going to keep it short. I think everybody knows the importance of having a vehicle that you can get around to, you know, to your job and many other things. Um, when I was a, a child, I was out on my bike all the time. You know, I couldn't. Instead of uh, being in the home, I just I was out and about, and, uh, but I was sort of confined. I hope you guys can hear me here. Yeah. Uh, to uh, how far I could ride my bike, you know, and it was just like that was my area. And uh, basically, once I got a little bit older and I got a car, just things opened up. That was just like kind of freedom to me, you know, just being able to move and do as you please, um, and you know, just in. In life, that's important, but there's also a lot of other things like your job, um, you know, maybe your circle of influence you're looking at is maybe a little bit limited just based on where you're thinking of going or what your ability to get there would be, I would say. Um, so just having reliable transportation is definitely going to help with that. A lot of times, if you go to a job interview, that's going to be one of the questions that you hear no matter where you go is, do you have? So basically, just in short, all I want to do is just try to help with that. Um, there's many different aspects to owning a vehicle that people may not think about. You know, just, um, and I, this might be a little bit better just if you have questions for me. I'm more than happy to discuss that with any anybody here. Um, but there's, a, like, as far as owning a vehicle, financing it, there's many different things that maybe you don't think are obtainable, and I just want to help out with that. So if, if any of you have any questions about how to do that, you know, maybe you think you can't get into a vehicle or you don't know how to finance it, I just want to have that discussion with you. I'm here to consult with you so on an individual basis. So I guess that's basically where I would come from on this. Is, uh, I just want you to know that there's somebody to talk to if you have questions about this. I, we included a, a pamphlet, and I've got some more coming about uh, the credit. I think they put that together, so maybe read through that. That's the other thing, too, with this is uh, just maybe helping with the credit. I deal with the financial institutions a lot, so in addition to just the vehicle, maybe things you can do to help build your credit. One of the things that is very, um, that bothers me is people that maybe have uh, a tough time with credit, they end up paying the most for everything. And I always want to try to help that out, you know, an interest rate, you're just trying to get on your feet, and it's that much harder for me for me to go. So I want to mitigate that as much as I can. I guess, I guess anyone have any questions about anything? I'm just keeping it up. Otherwise, um, I, again, I'm available, so just please reach out to me and uh, let me know. Thank you very much. Everybody needs a reliable vehicle. Look to the person next to you and say, you got a reliable vehicle? Check your credit. <laughs> it's, it's important to have good credit, especially as men. You need to have good credit. We need to have good credit. I need to have good credit. Because did you know that when you go and apply for a job, they actually are now doing credit checks on you. They want to see what your uh, responsibilities are. See how you are uh, able to man up and be responsible. And having good credit says something about your name and who you are. And you want to be able to just line that up with strategic planning. How can I assess where I am in life and what it is that I need to do to get to the next level?
Look to the person next to you and say, get to the next level. Get to the next level. Yeah. How do you get to the next level? Brother Shane Price will tell you, no more games. Look to the person next to you and say, no more games. Yeah. Finish this year off. No more games. Step into the new year with a mindset. This is what I need to do. I need to have a vision. I need to have a mission. I need to have a strategic plan. And I need to work that out. Work it all the way out. Walk the steps out. Go through the process. Thank you, Aaron, for coming. Um, and uh, his card is in there. Now I'm going to bring to you uh, Brother Earl Ossetang. He's going to be talking to you about the importance of working with your hands. Let's give him a round of applause. talk about the, uh, the, the importance of working with your hands. Uh, you know, when Pastor Joanne mentioned that to me, I just thought, great. I can talk about my dad. He worked with his hands. In fact, if he were, if he were alive today, he'd be 102. If my mom were alive today, she'd be 100. All my life, watching my mom and dad work, they worked. My folks had nine kids. I'm the second son of nine. I have two younger brothers and a younger sister. And we all work. My brothers, my older brother was an electrician. I was an iron worker. Now, how many people know what iron workers do? Good for you. Love you, man. Now, iron workers get that crappiest jobs on the job because it's their job to get a building out of the ground. In the spring, in the mud, we're there tying rebar, making a building pop up out of the ground. And it doesn't happen overnight. So the importance of working with your hands and iron work, it's like Pastor Joe was saying, you don't start up at the top, you start at the bottom. And that's, iron workers know how to work together. We may not like one another, but we know how to get the job done. And we'll get it done on time, within budget, because that's what we gotta do. It's a mindset that we all have. And bless God, I did it. I was an iron worker for 45 almost years. And thank God I got to come home every night with all my digits, with nothing heavy on my feet. And uh, the importance of working with your hands. I have to tell you a story. About 50 years ago, my folks sold their 10 acre farm. And uh, my older siblings thought that, that I would buy it. But at the time, I was a sailor in the Navy, not anywhere close to here. And uh, so my folks sold the farm when I was gone and I came back and uh, the farm was still there. We would drive, me and my siblings would drive by from time to time. But three years ago, a friend of my brother's called him and said, Eldred, the Elmolan Fire Department is gonna have a practice burn on your folks' place. So I just thought, I have to check this out. So I checked it out, and sure enough, the barn, the granary, the machine shed, the garage was all in heaps. And the house was still standing. It said, do not trespass. I thought, who are they to tell me not to trespass? So I walked in the house with my phone and I took all kinds of pictures. And uh, I was sad because this was not the place <coughs> that I knew. This place was not filled with light. It is, it's like uh, the story of the sluggard in Proverbs. So I passed the field of the sluggard. The vineyard was in disrepair. The fence was in ruin. Weeds had grown up all over the place. 
and I thought, and I perceived, and I thought, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest, and poverty would come in like a band, scarcity like an army. Well, bless God, we are not sluggards. We know how to get a job done. I know how to get a job done. So, uh, yeah. What you're saying now? I don't know. I guess I'm done. So I would like to introduce Brother Shane Price. And uh, God bless you, Shane. This is, uh, this is a great uh, undertaking here. You did a good job. Give him another. I told Pastor Joe. I am not my father or my brothers. If you want to have a conversation with me, you're going to have to speak. It's your turn, sir. <laughs> uh, you know, he has, a, he has a strong handshake. And when I shook his hand this morning and met him, uh, his hand reminded me of my grandfather's hand, Warren Price, who was an engineer. You know, because it was meaty and big old way. I felt akin to him just from the handshake. Good morning to everybody. Good morning, good morning. Thank you all for coming out. I know you can be first man. But here we are. And that's, that's meaningful. What you do with your time is important. Uh, very meaningful. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so brief. My name is Brother Shane Price, and I am the co-founder of an organization called the Power of People. Personal Development and Leadership Institute to teach two things. Personal Development and Leadership. Personal Development and Leadership. There are times when people have leadership uh, potential, but haven't developed themselves personally. So when the leadership potential gets ahead of the development, right, we end up having a problem somewhere down the line. Um, we believe, and I founded that organization with my wife, Dr. Brother Cornelia Price, and she's an author of several books, but one of the books is called The Power of People. That's where we derive our name. Four kinds of people who can change your life. My wife's hypothesis is that in life, you're only ever going to meet four kinds of people. I used to argue her down a long time ago. It was 19 years ago. I would argue her down and say, honey, that was too elementary, right? She said, no, honey, there's only four kinds of people you're ever going to meet as long as you live. The color doesn't matter. The social economic status doesn't matter. I said, well, okay, then what are the four kinds of people? She said, they are adders, subtractors, dividers, and multipliers. And I said, sweetie, it's just a little more complicated. She's a, she's a professor at the University of Minnesota. I said, sweetie, it's, it's different. But you know what she showed me, you know, through processing and through conversation, that really there are only four kinds of people. And you, you can identify them. What's so important about that, that strategy is that you can use it to identify who is in your life and who needs to move out of your life. She says this, and I'm going to say it real quick. She says, an adder is somebody who loves you. They're in your life. They care about what you want to do, but they won't listen to your mess. She says, a subtractor is somebody who is in some degree of pain but doesn't completely know what kind of pain they're in or how to get out. And they're always trying to utilize you, suck the energy out of your life and always bring you down with their energy and their issues. But this is, this is about relationships, these four kinds of people. She says that the writers, though, are some people who are very intelligent. And they are vicious in some ways. They've been hurt. They've hurt really bad. 
and that they don't really want to get out of the pain that they're in. And they use your information that you've told them to bring you down or to get where they are trying to go. I'm teaching good. Right? Watch this. And then she said, then there are multipliers. Say multipliers. Multipliers. She said, multipliers, you may be lucky in life if you only need one. One multiplier can get you uh, absolutely where you couldn't go by yourself. A multiplier is somebody who lives their life on another plane, in another location, but they see you. Somebody say, I see you. I see you. I see you. And a multiplier looks out, they only reach for adders. And a multiplier reaches out for an adder, pulls them. Right? And they pull you to a place where you weren't before. Right? This is a multiplier principle. Yeah. Say multiply. Multiply. You might have a multiplier in your life, but you don't recognize it because the subtractor qualities in your life won't allow you to identify them correctly. And so you're just using them for the right now. <laughs> the truth of the matter is they're prepared to take you someplace that your life has never gone. Give this brother a hand for coming up. What's your name, brother? He's a member of this church. Give him another hand for loud. Sometimes the members of the church don't think they need to come out. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so we were getting members a good hand. Watch this. The young men who served us this morning, I was impressed with them. And I just want to say to the young brothers back here who served breakfast and, and they were very gracious and mannerful and yes, yes. neat and Everything, just give them a little yeah. round of applause. Yeah. Those are boys of hope, brothers. It's a boys of hope, brothers. Wow, yes. I, could, I could talk about that all day long, but I'm going to share one more thing and then I'll be out of your way. Uh, where it comes to relationships, relationships. Relationships are everything, family is everything. Wait a minute. You might say, well, family is something. I'm talking about family is everything. Just the other day, yesterday, I was at a home going celebration for an individual who had served over 30 years incarceration in the Stillwater and other, and other prisons. Uh, he was a conspirator in something a long time ago. And uh, one of his dreams was that kept him from going insane was that he was going to one day get out again and have one more chance to be in the arms of his family. Somebody say family. Family. Family is God's organized organism on the face of the earth. I'm going to say it again. Yes. Family. Say family. Family is God's, is God's organized, organized organism, organism on the face of the earth. On the face of the earth. This is how we become populated is through family. It's family that he used. Family birthed government. Family birthed cities. Family birthed townships. Family is everything. Family is relationship, and you have to think to yourself this morning, I, I'm going to be done with you in a minute, I, I'm sorry. You, look here, you have to recognize what is your role in family, what is your place in family, and how can I strengthen that? I'm going to give you eight steps to be able to strengthen your role in the family. We call it the eight steps to the good life. Somebody say the eight steps to the good life. Eight, eight steps to the good life. But everybody wants to live a good life, but everybody doesn't know how to get to the good life. It seems like in some ways it's impossible for me. I see you doing it, but how do I get there? And I'm going to try to show you just briefly how I believe that you can get to the eight steps of the good life. And it doesn't matter if you're accomplished. You can do more by, by utilizing these eight steps. You all ready? Yes. Mm -hmm. That sounded good to me. I feel good this morning. I appreciate Dr. Webb for inviting me and the church for hosting this. And just bringing a, a few men together in fellowship for me is very powerful. Because I, in, in some ways, my calling has been to educate and liberate the heart and mind of men. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've been at it for about 16 years, and I've been in the 
each one of the penitentiaries around the state of Minnesota. There's eight penitentiaries in Minnesota. At one time, I was doing one penitentiary per day, per week, for 15 straight years. I didn't even realize it. I stopped going in about a year ago. I didn't even realize I was that busy. One of the things we talked while we were in those incarcerated areas was the eight steps to the good life. How could you project yourself outside of the nature of your current situation? Mm -hmm. mm. Watch this. I'm going to show you some. The first step of the eight steps to the good life is, uh, let me take a guy right here, Ben, who's so busy doing something else. I'm writing down the Okay, steps. watch this. Give Ben a hand. Give Ben a hand. Come on up here. <laughs> quickly, quickly, and I, I'm going to go back and review this with Dan so he can finish his note taking at the very point. Um, then I'm going to change your name right now to Words. Can I do it? Absolutely. What is your name? Word. Thank you. Give Words a hand. <laughs> and the young brother uh, with the pretty tennis shoes on. Uh, I'm going to change his name to Destiny. What's your name? Destiny. What's your name? Words. Watch this. I'm going to bring Destiny down here. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Your words and your destiny are intricately tied together. But often, through the vicissitudes of life, you can't determine that because it gets confusing, right? Mumbo jumbo, this, that, drama, all of these other things come up and you can't see the difference between your words and your destiny. destiny. Right. But take this young man. Young man, what's your name? Uh, Raiko. Raiko. Yeah. Give Raiko a hand. <laughs> Raiko's name is going to be Thinking. What's your name? Thinking. What's your name? Words. What's your name? <laughs> Some people believe, uh, Pastor Joe, that thinking comes ahead of your words. But thinking is invisible. You cannot see it. And you can be a genius in what you are thinking. But until you put words word to it, nobody knows your genius. Is that right or wrong? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to take uh, this, this gentleman right here. Say your name, sir. Greg. Greg. What's up, Greg? Good morning. Come on up. Take Greg. Greg, we'll put you right here. We're going to change Greg's name to Emotions. Just look how emotional Greg is. <laughs> That's why I picked him. Because, see, he might not look so emotional on the outside, but inside, he's full of emotions. Like we all are. Yeah. <laughs> Your friend is getting a good laugh on your body, but I'm calling him Nick. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> Forgive me if I feel too comfortable and you know this and that because my job is to teach and to affect and impact the hearts of men. That is what I am called to do. That's right. Hey. So, Greg, is, your new name is Emotions. Look at it. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh, give him a hand, give him a hand. Yes. Trying to do something there. Come on up, come on up, you say. He thought he was going to be an observer. <laughs> My standard, right? Your, your name, we're going to change it to Decisions. Decisions. <laughs> What's your name? Decisions. <laughs> See, look. Don't he just look like a, a good decision? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait to happen. Wait, wait. wait. <laughs> so, what's your name? What's your name? Uh, oh, wait a minute. He stumbled. What's her name? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless him, Lord. What's her name? Words. Words. Emotion. Thank you. Decision. Destiny. Decision. Destiny. Emotion. Thank you. Destiny. Wow, give a hand, give a hand, give a hand. The next step right here is for my young boys right here. 
uh, right there, yeah, 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 yeah. His name is going to be Action. You're like, don't you look Action like one time? <laughs> What's your name, brother? Orange. Orange, yeah. See, Orange got the cool orange tennis shoes on. He was so quiet when he came up, I couldn't even hear his footsteps. Um, say your name now. Action. Oh, give him a hand. Oh. Oh. Who was that? Who was that? He hasn't got it. anyone look like at him. He's still him up. Bullshit. What's your name? What's your name? Good, good, good. Watch this now. What we're doing with developing a, a, uh, an operational nuance that you can utilize to appreciate what's taking place in your life between your words and your yes. These are the other actors that are participating in what's going to ultimately be your destiny. destiny. Your destiny. And each one of us have a destiny, whether you've been doing any thinking about that or not. Right? right? The notion is that somehow you're going to be able to impact the world in a better way based on your new understanding of your words and your thinking, which will later impact your yes. and cause people to come to you when they used to run away from you. Is that right or wrong? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. I like that. Um, I'm going to call this man right here. So come on, man. This young man right here. Give him a hand. Yeah. yeah. And his, his new name is See, look here. When habits come in, everything you say has got to bound up your be bound up by your words. Because your habit wants what it wants. Mm -hmm. It needs what it needs. And so it overtakes your words and therefore impacts negatively your destiny. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go on back, habits. Give habits a hand. <laughs> I'm going to conclude because I know my young brother is getting ready to come behind me and he's going to be able to take this to the next level. But let me just show you something. If you stand just like this, looking out into the world, and you stand right behind you, but you put your hands right up like this, and you do the same, put your hands right up like this. Yeah, and you do the same, and you do the same, and you do the same, and you do the same. Come on, come on, come on, sir. 
and you do the same, put your hand right up there, and all of a sudden, watch this, bam, <laughs> we push. Yeah. Wow. You see, and if we turn it the other way, it would work the same way in reverse because all of these things are absolutely positively connected to what you do on a day in, day out basis. Right. And it all generates from your words. words. Right. So words step out right here. Destiny step out right there. And so this is how you change your destiny, recover your family. Mm -hmm. Your family is your destiny. Yes. Your legacy and your destiny. Wow. And that is by changing your words and therefore altering your yes. destiny. Let me go back to this and I'm going to close. Here's how you know your words are incorrect. If you are speaking negatively, mm -hmm. if you have divisiveness in your heart, it's going to show up in your destiny. Yes. It's automatic. It's mathematical. That's right. It's got to happen. If you're talking to your children in a way that is negative, or you're allowing them to see things that are divisive, it's going to show up in your, yes. it's automatic. Oh, wow. wow. Watch this, and I'm done. But if you're using positive words, if you're sharing and, and having multipliers in your life, multipliers are people who know more than you and have been down the line of life. No. The old railroad term, down the line of life. And you having them speak into your life, it's going to automatically change your destiny. I want you to line up, same way, going back the other way. I'm going to show you something. Come on, man. Come on. Same thing. Come on, emotion. Look alive. Come on, three. Here we go. Watch this. Now watch this. Who pushed you? Say his name. Words. We got work with you. Yeah. <laughs> Who pushed you? Thank you. That was excellent. Who pushed you? Decisions. Excellent. But who pushed you, character? Habits. Habits. <laughs> Say habits. Habits. They remember for you. And then who did you push? Did you hear what he said? He said nobody. Watch this. That's wrong. Watch this. He pushed the unborn. Wow. Oh, there you go, there you go, there you go. He, he pushed the child who's not born yet. Wow. He pushed the one who has to come forward yet. Say that. And look, through the words, he's pushing the unborn, and the unborn is being impacted by the words that are coming out of his mouth. Wow. I'll wait for all the amens. Amen. 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 somebody here from God this morning. Yes, yes. Give yes. him a big hand. Then. Thank you. Hold it up. Everything starts with our words and it ends with our destiny. And if you don't believe that, I guarantee you the word of God says in the beginning was what? The word. And the word was? God. The word was God and the word was with God. Everything starts with the word. Either I can or I can't. Take I can't out and leave the word I can in. Look to the person next to you and say, I can. I can. And then look to the other person and say, I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. Come on, say it. I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. Put your hands together, y'all. Yeah. I am somebody. I am somebody in Christ. When I was seeking deep in sin, on my way to hell, scared to die. Somebody decided to die for me. And his name is Jesus. What a wretch to save a wretch like me. It is my honor and privilege to bring to you a great man of God that travels all over the city with a revival. And it's, it's, he's just a great man. I, I, I've watched him in action. And let's put our hands together for Brother West. Come on, Brother West. <laughs> oh, I think I know you guys. It's a lot of energy. Yeah. This is fun. So I was asked to speak on relationships. And I was going to talk about Jesus Christ for a little bit. I want to share the gospel. That's going to be good. So I'm not looking at a bunch of swords that need to get made, but a little, some swords that maybe need a little bit more sharpening, you know? That's what we do. We're together, right? Iron sharpening iron. Yes, sir. I like you guys so much. 
<laughs> you guys make it easy to talk. So, real quick question. Man, Genesis, made in the image of God. Image of God. Romans 4 through 7. It says Jesus came, he's the new Adam. Came to redeem us back to what we had in the garden. So what is my purpose then? To be an image of God. To be an image bearer of Christ. You guys got these great speakers coming up, hard to follow. I feel super blessed. I'm a young fella. You guys are real wise. <laughs> I'm just going to try to share what I've been taught. Well, Jesus is king and we got to bow a knee, you know? Jesus is king and we got to bow a knee. I was a pastor in Wisconsin. And we had a meeting one day and the Lord spoke to my heart. We were doing a whole lot of activities and a whole lot of events and presentations. But I had a heart issue. Jesus said, if you're supposed to be the reflection of me, if my first intended purpose for you was to be an image bearer, why would you let anything hinder the image you're supposed to bear? If I'm born again, John 3, if I'm born again, I am a reflection, I am a mirror of God. Why would I let any dirt sit on the mirror? You're at home, you brush your teeth, you know you go a little too fast and I get stuff on the mirror. You got to clean that mirror regularly, right? That's right. That's right. You got to keep that image good. Because when you get ready in the morning, you want to know what you look like. You want to know how you're walking. You want to know what you're carrying. You either carry the Holy Spirit or you don't. You're either born again or you're not. But all men were made to be an image of God. And that was stolen, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve. What did Satan say to Eve? If you eat this fruit, God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because he knows if you do, you'll be like him. We were made in the image of God. We were made to be God. What is Satan trying to change? Our image. What did Adam and Eve allow to happen? Their image to be changed. So no, now as we're born again, what has been restored? Our image. I can't walk around dirty saying I'm clean. I can't walk around serving the church, praying prayers, feeding the homeless as a way to be clean. See, those things were designed to be avenues of worship when you've already received the gospel. The other day I was sitting in my bed praying, I needed I need some time with Jesus. You know sometimes you just lay down and it's quiet and you just get in his presence and you just say, Dad, I'm here. <laughs> That word dad might have a weird feeling to you guys, and it had one to me too, but he's dad. Whether you like it or not, he's father. Whether you like it or not, he's going to raise you. You know? <laughs> That's right. When you're a son, he's your dad. Which comes first, the son or the father? The father makes the son. The son doesn't make the father. No, no, no. God is I am. That's because no one else can define him. Mm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one in the sanctuary crying because I thought I was a bad preacher. And God said, I don't care what you think of me. I am who I am. You just got to submit to it. That's right. Slow. Mm. I said, okay, come on. <laughs> so, I got born again. We're bearing images. We're doing these things. Let's not mistake the ministry for the ministering. We minister in the Holy Spirit, but is the Holy Spirit actually ministering in you? Are you getting away, man? Are you getting on your knees? Are you being sharpened? Are you being dull? When you use a knife, it cuts the edge. It needs to be sharpened again. That does not come by doing ministry. That comes by getting away and being ministered to. That comes by a son getting to know his father. I used to hate my dad. Because I wasn't a believer. I didn't know right from wrong. Like I said, I got born again. I came to my dad. I, I repented. I said, Dad, I was a terrible child. He said, yes, you were. He says, yes, you were. But well, before I could make reconciliation with my father on earth, I had to make reconciliation with my father in heaven. Because in order to be a son, I had to know what the father was. Come on, the son doesn't make the father, the father makes the son. In John 3, 16, I got a tattoo on my arm. God so loved the world, he sent what? His only son. So that whoever believed would not perish, but come into eternal life. And what does scripture say? When we believe, we've been given the right to be called what? 
sons and daughters. Come on, guys. I'm not looking at a room of a bunch of men who don't know who they are. I'm not in a room of a bunch of men who don't know who God is. I'm in a room with a bunch of men who need to realize that you're so loved. It's romance with God. It's romance. It's not slave and master because scripture says he called his friend now. It says the slave has no idea what the master is doing. Because I want y'all to get away and I want you to get in that closet and I want you to hide. I want you to hide. Mm. Psalm talks about his shadow of his wings covering you. Are you under that shadow? Man, are you getting hidden? Are you getting in that word? Are you eating? We do a lot of these things in a lot of ministry, and we think we're being filled, and we're not. The filling comes when your cup goes under the source. Jesus is the water, so where does the filling come from? Jesus. Your mission isn't to fill your cup. Your mission is to keep your cup safe so it can stay filled. And David talks about being safe under the wings, so where do you keep your cup safe? Under the wings of who? Jesus. Yahweh. Jehovah. You keep yourself hidden, I guarantee you stay found. You keep yourself hidden, I guarantee you stay found. I would bet most of y'all are older than me out here. I'm young, I'm about to tell you how old I am. I'm 24. I'm 24 years old. I look at a bunch of young, young men up here. You guys need to sprinkle some salt on me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying about that? Mm-hmm. You guys need to sprinkle some salt on me. Because I got to watch y'all and learn how to hide in the wings. Because wow. I got to watch y'all and learn what it means to be a man. Mm-hmm. I've got married a year and a half ago. I ain't got no children. But guess who I'm going to look at how to raise children? The men who went before me. Mm-hmm. I've only been married a year and a half. But guess who I'm going to look at how to be a husband? The husbands that went before me. Timothy said, be an example in your youth. Right. Don't let anyone discredit you, but be an example. And don't rebuke your elders, but encourage them. And I encourage you guys, hide in those wings so I can know how to hide. Mm. Run so I can know how to run. Be ministered to so I can know how to receive ministry. Be humble enough to know you're not number one so I know what it's like to be number two. Be Christ to me so I can be Christ to those who are coming after me. This whole destiny line, that was beautiful, by the way. Thank you so much. Be those words so that destiny, we can, young men can walk in that. You want to shake the earth, you let the Lord shake your heart. Come on. Let that hit. It hits a little bit different when you believe, right? Yeah. 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 What happens when you get believing believers? You get a redeemed city. You get a changed family line. Curses on generations get broken. That's good. When you decide to receive the gospel and submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, John 3, 3, be born again. John 3, 16, for God's love of the world. And then Galatians 5, when you bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, what begins to happen? You begin to multiply more trees. The only way the Great Commission, the only way that is done, is when you decide to be a plant firmly rooted by the water. Anybody know where that's found? Let's get in the Psalms again. Because you don't have the new without the old. Let that hit. You don't have the new without the old. You don't have the New Testament of the Old Testament. Jesus is king. And we're all his sons. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. It's a different story when Jesus is the one writing it. Amen. Mm, those words become life. Those thoughts become the mindset of Christ. This is scripture. This isn't like pulled out of himself. This is scripture. You get those habits. It's called not sinning. It's called being obedient in response to love. Your destiny becomes a son who walks with the Holy Spirit. In power. You know what I'm saying? I love you guys. You guys keep it so hard here. And then guess what happens? I don't have to this. I'm not sure how long I'm going to go I'm sorry. Guess what happens at the end? Fathers, you are a father in here. You have children, right? Yes. You want your kids to have it better than you had it, right? 
Oh, you ready for this? Yes. Where does it say we sit, Revelation? On Jesus sits the right hand of the Father. Guess where we sit? On his seat. Mm -hmm. So the same heart you have for your children to have what you had and better with your sacrifice and that lineage happening. Guess what? That was in the heart of the Father. And that's why he sent Jesus. So you can sit on the same seat. Jesus is going to sit. But guess what? You don't sit underneath Jesus. You sit right beside. Mm -hmm. Because he's the only reason you can even sit there. Because you're washed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. Come on. The gospel is this, that God sent his son into the world. But man did not receive him. Because they loved the darkness more than the light. But that those who have received him have been given a new name in Jesus. They've been given the right to be called sons and daughters. They've been given heirs, heirship in Christ Jesus. I'm here to tell you the only relationship that matters is with you and your father. I talk capital F. Not the one who birthed you the first time, but the one who birthed you the second time. Relationships start when you realize you were made to be in relationship with the very being that is relationship. Wow. That's good, bro. Genesis 3. The image wasn't your smile. The image was your purpose and your being. He's triune. You were made to be in relationship. Why do you think we had Adam and Eve? You were meant to be in relationship. Not just with the woman, but with God the Father. He is relationship. He's triune. His image is so that you would relate to him. But the only way you can have access to the Father is through who? The Son. The Son. This is Bible. This is Gospel. This is Christianity 101, but we leave, we leave it behind. Man, this is the only, this is the foundation you build everything upon. This is the kingdom. What does he say to Peter? He says, who am I? He says, I'm a sign. He goes, and that's how I'll build my kingdom on. You're the rock. It's that very principle right there. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the only one that matters. He's the only one to the Father. Amen? Amen. Come on, brothers. That's all I got for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for letting me share. It's a blessing. Thank you. You know, Wes is a busy man. And he's about that kingdom building. And so I'm, I'm so happy that you took the time to come and light the fire, to keep the fire burning. The next person that I'm going to bring up the next person, I'm, you all got excuse me. The next person I'm gonna bring up is my son. A great man of God. He's a pastor. He's a father. I get emotional because under structured leadership, before I left and went to prison, I tried to live a life in leadership, not knowing that when I leave, when I left, he would be remained in order to raise his children. My grandson is here with him. And my heart, who am I? I say it every Sunday, who am I? That God be, be so mindful of me to call me his friend, to allow me to be here at this time and at this place. No further ado, let's put our hands together for Pastor Diedrich, Pastor of Purpose Church. Come on, we can do that for now. Say amen. 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 Well, my pops love me. Put me up behind all these awesome speakers. First, give it out to the God, Pastor Joe. It is truly a blessing to be uh, in your presence on today. What an awesome word that has already been, been shared. Um, there's a story of a father and a son out on the fishing boat, and they had been out there all morning fishing. Son would look down at the bottom of the boat and would crack up and start laughing. Dad would say, what's so funny, son? And the son would say, nothing, Dad. A little time would spend a little bit later and the son would start laughing again. Dad would say, tell me what's, what's so funny. He'd say, hey, ain't nothing, Dad. And a little bit later, the son finally says, it's a hole in the boat. 
and you're going to drown. Not realizing he was also in the same boat. Right. We all come from different neighborhoods, different walks of life. We all are connected to Christ in different ways. But today, this morning, we are in the same boat. Amen. And we are challenging ourselves to get to the next level. It's very interesting because everything that I was going to share and talk about this morning, somebody else just shared and talked about. <laughs> but I believe if we, we, we understand the concept of the Great Commission with Pastor Joe and the SWAT process. We take that and we, we, we integrate that with the understanding of our words become our destiny. Mm. And we take that with the most responsible, the most uh, reasonable and most responsible relationship that we are entitled to in our life. And that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. My father asked me to speak on relationships today. And I want to share with you all that I believe that relationships, the most significant relationships in a man's life, is a relationship that he didn't pick himself, but it was a relationship that he was assigned to. When we look at the second chapter of Genesis, when God says, let us make man, let us make him in our image, he should be successful, he should have dominion and power. He first gives Adam an assignment. He puts him to work. If you're going to be a man, you're going to understand relationships, you're going to have to learn how to work. That's what my brother said. You got to be good with your hand. You got to have a trade. You got to have a purpose. You got to have a mission. As Adam was doing his assignment, it is then when God said, it ain't good for him to be without relationships. He puts him to sleep and he takes the most vital, the most fragile bone of his body, and he subtracts it, and he adds and multiplies his life, and he wakes up, and he has a woman. Is that a woman he get to pick? He didn't get to pick. He, he, didn't, he didn't get to go to the club, or he didn't get to go to the, to the grocery store to pick this woman. He was assigned to this woman. And what makes that uh, so significant? Because if you know the story between Adam and Eve, the time was going to come where the relationship got rocky. Somebody was going to break the rules. Somebody was going to miss the mark. Somebody was going to bite the apple and present the apple. And because it was a relationship he was assigned to, they were able to withstand the test of times. I come to you, man, today challenging you. I challenge you because we sometimes walk away from the assignment. The voices are at an all-time high because we walk away from the assignment. Our sons are lost to the jail cells and graveyards because we walk away from the assignment. And when we understand the purpose and the position of a man, then we'll understand we can't afford right. to walk away from the assignment. Right. Well, this week, this Sunday, all of us get to stand in the sanctuary and we get to acknowledge the greatest birth that was ever born. That's the birth of Jesus Christ. But it's the most significant view of a relationship that I believe we overlook in our life. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. We understand that Jesus' natural relationship, the first person that he would physically connect with, the first person that he would physically feel the warmth of the love was the love of Mary, his mother. And I am here to challenge every last one of us. If we don't understand the process of manhood, we think the process of manhood starts with man raising man, man teaching man. But I come today to challenge you that the process of proper relationships starts with the relationships with the most important woman in our life, and that's our mother. Amen. We find out that Jesus is born. It's a physical separation. The baby is physically separated from Mary. That's the first series, the first cut, the first separation, a physical separation. That's why the Bible says a man who finds a good woman will leave his house of the mother of the father and they will go off together. The second time we see in scripture, Mary and Jesus having conversation. Jared, Mary in the, in the caravan has trans, uh, uh, have walked out of the cities about three days and he hits her. Wait a minute, where's my baby? Where? Where's Jesus? I ain't seen him in about three days. And the Bible says her and Joseph trek back to the community and they find Jesus in the temple. Notice, 
Joseph doesn't chastise Jesus. Mm. Joseph doesn't say, Negro, where you been? Hey, hey, rascal, where you been hiding at? He doesn't do that. Mary says, where you been? Why have you departed from us? And Jesus says, I must be about my father's business. This is around the age of 12 or 13. This is when we boys begin to start smelling ourselves, when we begin to try to have an identity of who and whose we are. The scriptures next time brings up Mary and Jesus together in context. They're at a wedding. Yeah. And they, they kick it. Pastor Joel, the, the Moscato that ran out. They, <laughs> they, they, they ain't got no more crowd roar. They, they kicking it. And, 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 and Jesus looks at, Mary looks at Jesus and said, we got a problem here. Uh, there's no more wine in the party. And Jesus says, it ain't my time. It's about 30 years old. It's 29, Pastor uh, 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 Brother Christ, he's about 29, 30 years old. He says, not, my time is not yet at hand. And, and, and the, the, the mother looks at, at the disciples and says, whatever he tells you to do, yeah. you need to do it. Yeah. Here's his mother pushing him into his mission. He's yeah. just about to push him to launch his ministry. Jesus said, I ain't ready yet. And the man, as y'all know the story, he turns water into wine. About two and a half years later, 18 months later, Jesus is preaching. He's now, Brother Pastor West, he's now famous. He's, he's known all over Judea. He's, all, he's known all over the region. And y'all know in text, he's preaching, and, and, and they stop the sermon and say, hey, your mama, your mama's outside. She wants you to stop the service Acknowledge her, she's outside. And the Bible says that Mary, that Jesus says, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Those that do the will of my father. This was a push into his purpose to understand the social cutting, to understand you may be famous, you may you may be known all over the region, but if we're gonna be men, we gotta understand that we have to learn how to stand on our own principle, on our own Mary. The very last scene. What Jesus and Mary have talked about in context, in scripture. He's now dying on the cross. He's stretched out. He's stretched wide. Blood is trickling down. He's, he's, his body is breaking down. He looks down upon his mother. And he does what a man is supposed to do. He recognized his assignment. He recognized responsibility. He says, woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. We as men, the most important thing we can do in all of our sons' lives, in all of our women, mothers' lives, all of our wives' lives, all of our community lives, is when it comes time to be at the end, when it comes time to deal with a pandemic, when it comes time to deal with crisis, when it comes time to deal with death, even when it comes time to take our last breath, they'll be able to say, we died as a man. Mm. Put your hand together. Mm. That boy sounded like somebody I knew. Uh, that was good, bro. Yeah. I want to take a pause here a moment. Um, small group. We have one more speaker, and I'm going to wrap it up after our uh, dear beloved brother, Doug Seaman. But, you know, one of the things that we do to carry on the Great Commission is that we support and we lend the best way we possibly can. And, you know, we didn't charge for the men to come in and eat today. We didn't charge for our young men. Give our young men that serve us. Come on, give them a round of applause. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the social dad. There's a bunch of us in here that, that all their social dads. I called them and I said, what are you doing Saturday? They said, we're not doing nothing. Good, 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 good. I got something for you to do. And without hesitation, they came. And they did it because they love to want to be of something greater than themselves. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm just going to ask if you or one of you young brothers come up, will you? It don't matter which one of you. 
if we're going to take up an offering, whatever lo the Lord you can provide, we want to be able to render to pass an envelope out to each person. Uh, we want to be able to render some sort of gift unto the Lord for the ministry, the carrying on the Great Commission here at this location. And it starts here. It starts at the bottom. And so, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, his office is right down the hallway from mine, and he's never in his office. He's always in mine. <laughs> the office that he gave me, <laughs> which was his office. So, quite naturally, if you are going to be making out a check, you can make your check out to SLC Men's Ministry. And we just believe that whatever we see, it will go forward. And in the manner in which uh, it is intended to do, specifically for the men's ministry. And, you know, our, our speakers came in and uh, just gave of themselves on a moment's notice. And we're so happy for them. Our staff, our extended staff, our chef. Did she do a great job? Come on, put your hands together for Sister Gwen. And uh, if you need to make out uh, the check, make it out again to SLC, the men's ministry. If you want to use your credit card, you can use your credit card, use all 16 numbers, and then put your expiration date in the slots that you see, and then you put your three-digit uh, code. We have a great uh, finance department here. Everything that is given is well taken care of and, and recorded. And because this is the men's ministry, uh, if you ever wanted to call in, the IRS called you and told you, listen, we need to see your records, what you've been spending, what you've been given. The accounting department here at this church has a complete record of what we're doing. So if we could go ahead and do our due diligence unto the Lord, we want to be able to do that. And uh, we're going to have Brother Joseph, if you get it completed, we're going to ask Brother Joseph to go around with this uh, bucket. And thank you. And uh, Phil, uh, put that envelope in that uh, bucket. And we're going to have our security team take it up and do our, our due diligence as well. Now it's my great privilege to bring to you a great man. I haven't known him very long, but it seemed like I've known him all my life. That's right, that's why I think We share the same home. He left last night, moved into his brand new home. Put your hands together for Doug. His home, and he moved on in the physical. For a moment, he don't know. I took him to his house, so I know where he stays. <laughs> so he's never far away. I can pick up the phone and text him. And it has been a true honor to have met him and to, uh, for him to allow me into his life and he into mine. And with no further ado, let's put our hands together again for Brother Doug Seabit, who's going to be talking about the importance of sobriety. Good morning, my brothers. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before all you guys. Um, I got to admit, this is my really my my first public speech. You know, there's a lot of people, but it seems like there's 500,000 people here. That's right. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. I want to say again, my name is Doug Sibbent, um, aka Dougie Fresh. Yeah. And, and, uh, I belong to the Paro People Institute. And uh, I want to just acknowledge that Mr. Shane Price is a true multiplier in my life. I can honestly say that, and I will publicly say that. All my brothers are the power of people. This is why I'm here today. Let me just, let me give you a little background about myself. I grew up, and everything that I can say relates to everything that all of you guys have said. 
You know, um, I grew up in, a, in an average family, mom, dad, and um, everything was okay as I was young. But as, as the brother said, I lost my mother, which crushed me. She was she was my my backbone. Other than the godfather up, upstairs, my mother was my best friend. That's right. She kept me in line. The, the main reason that I stayed in line was I did not want to disappoint my mother or break her heart. My mother passed away and I fell apart. I, I was married, I had children, I had a good job, and I, it all went away. Mm. I started um, my addiction about 20 years ago. Um, and ever since then it was bad. You know, and, and with my mother's death, I blamed God, hated God. I knew he was still there, but I just did not like him. I, we, we were at odds. And it's a funny thing because I grew up, in, you know, in, in the church and everything like that. But when my mother died, I blamed God. And, and, you know, I look back now and I can relate that, you know, God let me do it my way. He's like, no, you know, you know, I think he just stood aside and said, okay, you know, you do your thing. And I went right down the drain. I lost my family. I lost my job. I lost my car. I lost my home. I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I was living on the street. I got involved with the law. I did time in prison. And, um, and then came, you know, I hit rock bottom when I went to prison. And, it, and at that time, I was incarcerated for some time, and I met the Power of People Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. From that very first day in that class, it changed my life. Uh, With then, I seen God. God came back into my life and presented me with these guys of the, of, of the Power of People. Come on now. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm trying to get at is that the main thing for me is the power of God and my sobriety. Mm. The sobriety, other than God and my, and my children, is the number one thing in my life. Mm -hmm. The reason being is that if I'm not sober, I'm not thinking right. Mm. I'm not thinking of God, I'm thinking of myself. Right. And, and it, when you're in an addiction, it is the most selfish thing you could possibly do to anybody in your life. Because it's all about you. Wow. And you walk over people. I mean, I'm not proud. I can admit it now. I'm being transparent. I've crushed everybody in my life when, through my addiction. Mm -hmm. And by the grace of God, they are all still with me today. Wow. They never gave wow. up on me. God never gave up on me. Mm -hmm. He let me do my thing. I came back to him. He brought me back to him. That door has always been open for me. All he said was, you need to knock and I will be there. I turned my life around to God and it has been an unbelievable journey for me. I've been sober four and a half years now. Wow. I've been sober four and a half years. And from the day I became sober, I went to prison. I, I joined uh, the power people. Um, I, I, God is number one in my life right now, but my sobriety as a, as a living creature is my sobriety. I can't do nothing without that. Yeah. As of today, I have a good job that I love. I, as uh, uh, Brother Webb said, I just closed on a house yesterday. Wow. I'm a now a homeowner. <laughs> family who love me dearly and they're in my corner they're all very proud of me I get I've reunited my 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 grandbaby or my, my excuse me my daughter was living with her grandmother for the last four years while I was in prison she is now living with me as of yesterday dad it's, it's so weird because you know she's been apart from me and, and she said Dad, it is it is a surreal feeling because now I don't have to text you at night to say goodnight. Wow. I can look at you 
in the morning and say, "Good morning, Daddy." Uh, we're, we're this. She said, "This is our time." Wow. Yes. wow. And it all starts with my sobriety. Wow. You know, this year has been a pandemic for everyone, and it's been real tough. Sure. But I can say this for me personally, yeah. with the with the grace of God. That this year has been one of the best years of my life. Yeah, wow. I've, got a, I've got a good job. I got a brand new car. I bought a brand new house. I have all my brothers who are in my corner. That's right. I can I can call who took on me into their lives as long as my with my daughter too. That's right. My daughter is so proud to be part of the power people. Yeah. She has fifty uncles. That's right. Right. She yeah. tells all her friends. <laughs> That she has people, and you want to mess with me? I make one fall, and they're coming fifty feet. <laughs> that is an honest to God's truth. But she loves them all. She loves the attention. Yeah. You know, it, 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 for me, I could say there is not a better institution that I have ever been involved with, other than the, the grace of God and the power of God, to be involved in the power of people. Yeah. It is amazing. And all I can say is sobriety is number one. Without that, nothing will happen. You don't think level-headed. You, it, 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 is, it is the most selfish thing that I can do. And by the grace of God, he chose me to come out from, the, from under the rocks of hell Ooh. to where I am today. And it is an honor for me to be here to share my story with you. All right. So thank you very much. Young man, I want you, uh, a young BOD, you, sir. Uh, BOH, young brothers, all four of you, or three of you, to come up and grab a bag and give each person a bag in this room. And you all can put your folders in that bag. It's just a way of appreciation. Uh, Fury Motors has been behind us. Fury Motors has been behind us and doing what uh, they need to do is to help us in a mighty way. I'm not going to be long. I'm going to be very short, briefly. And as my son said, everything that everybody talked about is in my structured leadership talk. So I'm just going to leave you briefly with a few words. And I put them together in a pamphlet for you so you all can carry it on with you wherever you go. We're going to be meeting again sometime in February. We want you to bring three people with you. Commit to bring three people. And, you know, I'm subject to call you. I have all your numbers just about. I do because I had to send you the ticket. So don't be surprised if I ask you to speak. But we're going to kind of, we're going to try to do this again in February. We want to connect. We want to see how you're doing in the community, how we are contributing to the community, to our fellow man. Brother Shane brought up the eight steps of a good life, and the first thing that I thought about is kindness of our words creates confidence. The kindness of our words create confidence. Words have power. And they can either bring life or they can bring death. Kindness causes us to think. See that? A couple of words in there. Eight steps of good life. It causes us to think. And it creates profundity. And then kindness and in, in, in giving creates a loving atmosphere. Our words. Our words have power. And in leadership... We have to learn how to maintain and manage our words. If we don't manage our words, our words will manage us. We have to be in control of ourselves. We have to be in control of our words. One of the things that I learned being in the mem uh, a member of the Power People Leadership Institute, which I love, is in me, my DNA. I am in com competition with nobody. And 
in order for me to grow, there's no competition here. There is no competition if we want to grow as men. We can't compete against each other. I have no desire to play the game of being better than you. I have the desire to be better than I was yesterday. And that's all it is. If I'm putting one foot in front of the other, and if I happen to stumble, I know that I have, like Doug said, 50 brothers that have come to my rescue and lift me up in time of need. I'll give a little story real quick. We have a brother that is a very good brother. He's a pop brother. Power People Leadership Institute brother. That's what we call pop. It's a short word. And he had been dealing with some things. And I had been feeling a certain way. And Pop called us one night, the whole house, and said, we need to run to his rescue. And I remember that when I was at my lowest point, a man and a woman came and breathed a breath of life on me in my lowest hour. And I didn't have it to give, but I stepped out on faith, and I gave it. And even though I was, okay, there was a need. There was a need. And the moment that we see the need in others, and we step up and do our part, that's leadership. Don't let nobody tell you anything different. That's leadership. It doesn't matter if it's 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. You can call. He prefer you call him doing business hours. But if it's an emergency, as it was when our brother Geronimo, when he went up there, had that accident, could have lost his life. 18 wheeler hit him from behind and another truck hit him head on. Who went and got him? Who stepped up to the plate as a leader and as a father? Shane Price drove all the way up to the Sox Center and brought him back. That's leadership. We lead by example. And if we tend to have our younger guys to want to be better than we are, we lead not in competition, but together. Amen. We strive together. We, 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 low, we low, put this load together and we move together. Right. That's what it's all about there. Amen. Some roads, you may have to travel alone in leadership. Because sometimes other people can drag you down. It could be family. Those are, those are just star people. I don't even want to get into the, the, the aspects of it, but you know, we just have family that just feel like they're always there. They always, you know, expect you to do, be, say. Those are just star. But we also have to be able to work a balance in learning how to say no in leadership. Leadership don't necessarily, and saying no don't mean it's a denial. God just says, he tells us to say no because he knows what's best for us. Mm -hmm. Pastor uh, uh, Price told me one time, he says, just stay there. You don't know what God has for you. Just stay there. Many of you know my story. I went to prison. I was protecting my grandson sitting in his room. I didn't know how I was going to get out. The first place I saw when I left was when I looked back and I see my son standing there, not knowing if I'd ever see him again. The first face I saw, 27 years later, when I come out of that prison, it was my son, the grown man. Wow, wow. Leadership, he's walking in leadership. Something I must have said or the way that I lived before I went caused him to say, for God I'll live and for God I'll die and I've got to be better than what my dad did. Leadership. Structured leadership. The seeds that we plant. The ground that we till. One plant, one water and the other, God will give increase. And then Sometimes the worst place that we can be is in our own head. Amen. Yeah. Sometimes my greatest thoughts, my greatest thoughts, because I didn't seek the guidance of God. 
or the refuge of God and the support of others that can honestly say to me, no, that's not the right way. And try to do it on my own, I failed every time. Mm -hmm. But the moment I became willing to listen and just simply surrender to the fact that I didn't have all the answers, that's when God began to move. Wow. Structured leadership. Sometimes in leadership, you have to be willing to listen to other people. Yeah. You've got to be willing to say, you know, there's an order here. This man ain't been on the job 20 years for nothing. He ought to know something. Irregardless if I'm in human services or up in executive suites, this man been here. I can't walk in and say expect him to think that I know what he's doing. He's an expert at what he's doing because he's been doing it a long time. Not only does his work prove it, but his paycheck prove it. His work ethic. Leadership calls us to have a work ethic. Structured leadership. Being able to be flexible, being able to listen, being able to understand that a team of people working together is better than one person. Come on, come on. In leadership, there's a lot of toxicity. People around you that can be toxic. We can't let negative and toxic people rent space in our head. One way to get rid of it is raise the rent and kick them out of there. <laughs> huh? You all know how it be. You've had rent on owners that kept raising the rent, raising the rent. Why does they keep raising the rent? You come in the person's home, they got holes in the wall, carpet all messed up, ain't taking care of the property, so the man keep raising the rent. He's raising the rent, not because He's raising it because he can. But he's raising it hoping that you can't pay so you can leave. And this is how we have to look at toxicity. When people around us that are toxic and are not healthy, in leadership you have to be able to say, you gotta go. Yeah. You can't compromise it. In leadership, you have to be able to say, it's okay to not be invited to some things. Because some things, you don't want to be around anyway. Everybody don't have the same mission. Everybody don't have the same vision. Everybody don't are not inspired the same way that you are inspired. It's okay to not be included. Sometimes that's God's way of protection for each of us individually. Leadership causes us, cause us to, it says, we have to put God in everything that we do. I don't care how you think about it. God has to be somewhere at the top. I can't go and do my work if I've not prayed and asked God to give me direction. I don't have to have a long, a long, drawn out prayer. Just say, speak, Lord. Speak. Walk away from people who put you down while you're in leadership. Walk away from fights that will never be resolved. Walk away from trying to please people who will never see your worth. The more you walk away from things that poison your soul, the healthier you'll be. Come on, that's good. Mm -hmm. And here's the last part of it. In leadership. Those who walk with God always reach their destiny. Yeah. Those of us that walk with God. On behalf of Pastor Joe, Brother Earl, and our brother Victor, who is recovering, we want to just say thank you. Thank you for making this Saturday morning meaningful. I'm sure that each of you that are sitting in this room could have had many other things to do, but you chose to come together as men to understand strategic planning, the importance of working with your hands, 
relationships, building relationships, whether it be in the church, whether it be in the family, whether it be in the community. And most importantly, understanding that in leadership, there has to be structure. But in that structure, knowing that we cannot do it, can't move, can't breathe without God. Let's stand to our feet. Come on, put our hands together. small foundation laid the cornerstone was already laid the cornerstone is Christ and there is no other cornerstone um, I'd like to see you again and I'd like to see you no later than three months from now stay in touch with us anyway if you need any help trying to figure out exactly how you should deal with your particular issues and your particular ministries um, I strongly encourage you to take a good look at, every three months, take a good look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, most especially your opportunities, and the threats that come from outside. Because it's like a cross. You start up here with, with a great commission, and you work down to results, but you get things that cause trouble from the left side, from the from your own interactions, and then you get troubles that come from the right side, from the world at large, the political world, the social world. And let us, let us begin to build, not just a men's ministry, but a ministry for men. Because men today they're not encouraged to be men. They're not encouraged to be leaders. They're not encouraged to work together. Because the devil's very much afraid, very much afraid, that if men work together, he won't stand a chance. In Jesus' name. You want to close now? Let's pray. Let's give Pastor uh, Joe a hand, would you? The great leadership of this church ordained by God, allowed this to take place. And it would be remiss of me not to mention our dear mother and pastor, Pastor Judy Fornaro, who eagerly saw what Pastor Joe and I and Brother Earl and Brother Victor were trying to do. And she said, go forward. We thank God for her. Father, we thank you today as we get ready to leave this place. God, we pray that we don't leave your presence. We ask that you touch every man in this room, every young man, older man, middle-aged man, those that are here, those that left. We pray that you will guide and direct our footsteps. Lord, we pray that you will restore unto us the joy of your salvation. Reignite in us a urge and a, and a, and a, a, a dependable urge to go forward in your name to help somebody along the way to encourage them to lift them to show them by precept and by precept by example not just in words but in our deed in order that they may see that there is a better way we pray oh god that these men that are standing in the gap we pray that you will bless their homes their children, their families, those young men that have mothers, older men, parents that are still alive. We pray that as we leave this place, we'll go and we'll take care of them. We ask for forgiveness of where we failed, where we we faltered, where we stalled. We pray that you will ignite in us and re-energize us to go forward in our churches, go forward in our organizations, go forward in our homes, go forward in the community. Teach us, speak to us, but most importantly, give us the will and the mind to pull over to hear your voice. We thank you, and we leave this place much better than we came. In Jesus' name, 
We all said amen and amen. amen. Give each other a hug and we're out of here. <laughs>